I want to give props to Denholm, Quebec, my rural homestead for most of the pandemic. Gently rolling hills, good hiking. Terry and I kayak on the lake for relaxation. A relaxed hurley in a kayak is a visual your imagination may want to avoid, just saying. We've been talking about how important it is to digitally connect rural and remote Canadians, especially now. Our presenting sponsor, TELUS, is committed to that. So let's move four provinces west, from Denholm, Quebec, to Eden Valley, Alberta. It's known for its sweeping terrain of hills and valleys. Gorgeous, but also a natural interruption for cell signals. When COVID hit, there was an outbreak at a nearby meatpacking plant, where many members of the Bear Spa First Nation worked. 18 Bear Spa members tested positive. Immediate communication with Alberta Public Health became critical. The province reached out to TELUS for help. So TELUS quickly deployed a cell site on wheels. They call it a cow. Normally used for one-off occasions. Community leaders got to work, tracing contacts to limit the spread of the virus. Those who were infected went into isolation. Supports were put in place for families as they recovered. Key to it all was immediate connectivity between residents, their families, and public health officials. The ongoing work to connect rural Canada in partnership with government is so important to tell us. They believe in bridging digital divides so that all Canadians are connected to the technology and resources we need to thrive. You can learn more about it by going to connectingcanadaforgood.ca. Greetings, congenial hurly burlyites. Top of the podcast to you. It's a double pod today. A double pod on the hurly burly typically consists of one part guest, one part political panel, two large coffees, three you forgot to turn off your mute buttons, and a hand rolled cigarette I have burning off camera for aromatherapy purposes. Jeff Rubin is our guest for part one. Jeff is the number one best selling author of Why Your World is About to Get a Whole Lot Smaller and the former chief economist for CIBC World Markets. We're going to talk about his new book, The Expendables, and his argument about the middle, that the middle class got nothing out of globalization except the bill, and how the blowback to all of that is changing the developed world. Part two of the pod is the comms and campaign gurus you've come to loathe, which is a brand new word I just invented that combines loathe and love. It's a complicated feeling, I know. Our political panel, with Scott Reed and Jenny Byrne. We'll pick up on my conversation with Jeff. We'll continue to talk about the government response to the second wave of the pandemic and growing COVID comms confusion. And we'll tell some stories about spouses and family members contributing. And I'm doing the air quotes fingers right now to campaign strategy. And we'll debut a new segment near the end of the panel we call, Hey You. Here's how Hey You works. Each of us will throw out a single question out into the social media ether for a politician or public figure. Will it be entertaining? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it will. Will somebody take the bait and give us an answer? We'll see. Will somebody create a burner account and masquerade as that public figure to try to fake us out? Seems like a lot of work, but go for it. Anyway, stick around for Hey You. Jeff Rubin, I want to thank you for being here with us today. Thanks for taking the time. You're a busy guy. My pleasure. So, first of all, we're now into month eight or nine of COVID. How are you? How you been doing? How you been, been holding up? Fine. Yeah, what you doing? Where you where you where you hanging out these days? I hang out where I always hang out. I, I live in Toronto. Um, I did get my annual BC salmon fishing trip into the Stamp River on Vancouver Island, in, so I really have nothing to complain about. Obviously, my cross country book tour got canceled and hence doing things like this. <laughs> right. You got to adapt. To <laughs> you want to sell books. You, uh, you, you must miss the Delta Hotel tour. Yes. That you would normally have been on. That's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, they're doing a lot of digital events and uh, hopefully um, that'll work. Right. Right. Um, so you've written a book called The Expendables. This is not a action movie featuring a bunch of washed up old Hollywood action heroes. This is a book about the middle class and globalization. What is the main thesis of the book, Jeff? You could just walk my listeners through that. 
Well, it tries to explain uh, a phenomenon that's been taking place for the last three or four decades, both in the United States and Canada, and throughout what would be called the OECD countries, the sort of what used to be called advanced industrial economies. And the phenomenon is the disappearance uh, of the middle class by virtually any criteria you wish to measure this, and tracing what has driven that. And the central argument of the book is that the reduction of the middle class is a direct result of the trade policies that have developed over the last 30 to 40 years, uh, specifically globalization and the ability to source cheap labor on the other side of the world, which is something that you couldn't do during the heyday of the middle classes in the 50s and 60s, not because it wasn't available. In fact, the wage gap was even greater than it is today. But back then, if you tried to move your factory there, you wouldn't have a hope in hell of ever being able to sell what you made in that factory back to the country where that factory was coming from, because there were huge tariffs, if not outright quotas, that prevented you from doing that. That's basically so, the central punchline of the book. And then we talk about the political reaction to that disenfranchised middle class, starting with Brexit, the strength of the Sanders campaign in the Democratic Party, and then ultimately Donald Trump's riding the wave of populism into the White House. Right. So, spoiler alert, I agree with your thesis, but let's just poke at it for a second which is when, when we talk about the, the decline of the middle class or even, as you said, pretty much the disappearance of the middle class, what are we talking about? Because just anecdotally, Jeff, when I look at the subdivisions of the kind of places I grew up in, people often have nicer homes than they had when I lived there in those places in the 60s and 70s. They have better televisions. They got better cars. They take more vacations. Winter vacations were a rare thing when I was a kid. Uh, mm -hmm. Rich people, only the affluent people took winter vacations. So in what way does the is the middle class worse off now than it was 20, 30 years ago? Well, maybe, David, it's because the people who used to live in those subdivisions that you're referring to don't live there anymore. And they don't live there anymore because they can't afford to live there anymore. But if you look at sort of percentage of households that fall, in the category of the middle class. And the OEC defines this as household incomes between 70 to 200% of the median. So in Canada, that would be 40 to 70, 28 to 75,000 with a medium income of 40,000. Slightly different in the other countries, but basically in that range. They're not only a shrinking share of the population, for the first time, no longer the majority of the population, but their economic weight has shrunk even more than their share of the population. For example, in the 1980s, the middle class would have accounted for 40% of household expenditures in the United States. 60%. Today, they're 40%. That's the same percentage as the top five households. They're also a lot older. People of our generation, baby boomers, over 70% of us were middle class. When you go to millennials, less than 60%. When you get to Generation X and Z, less than 50%. And for you know, the middle class incomes are growing at about a fifth of what they were a decade or two ago. So smaller, older, poor, some would say showing all the signs of extinction. And I would argue that's not an accident. That's a direct repercussion of the trade policies that we've adopted in the last 30 years that have helped some people enormously, but have hurt others just as much. So where has that money gone that used to go to middle class households? Has it gone to affluent Canadians like myself or has it gone to Asia? Okay, it's gone it's gone to both places. Um, it's gone to Apple shareholders 
because iPhones and computers are made by Chinese labor making $1.50 an hour, not the $15 an hour minimum wage in California where Apple is based. And if it was, those devices would cost differently. So it's gone to Apple shareholders. And of course, it's also gone to Chinese workers because the wages and jobs that would have produced iPhones and computers in California or Texas or Washington state are now produced halfway around the world. And the only reason that they're produced halfway around the world is because labor is one tenth the cost. And under the World Trade Organization's trade rules, Apple can then export those back to any market it wants virtually duty free. So, yes, Apple shareholders have benefited. Uh, Japanese, uh, sorry, Chinese tech workers have benefited. American and Canadian workers have lost. Although before COVID, Canada had a very low unemployment rate, right? That's Historically right. low unemployment. Yes, rate. yes. And Isn't that a sign that, that the economy is working? Uh, GDP's done just fine, but if I'm an expendable, why do I give a shit about GDP? Because my income hasn't grown in thirty years, so you know GDP is not really the issue here. Uh, you know, I think you raised a very good point. We were near full employment, not just in Canada, in the United States, in the UK, a lot of places. When I got my economics degree, there was a thing called the Phillips curve. It was a standard economic theory that on one axis you had the rate of wage increases and the other the unemployment rate. And what it basically said is that as the economy got closer to full employment, wages would increase because strikes would become more costly. Why hadn't that happened? Well, it hasn't happened because in order to go on strike, you've got to belong to a union. Okay, in the 1950s, in the heyday of the middle class, one out of every three American private sector workers belonged to a union. Today, it's one out of 20. Okay, and the few unions that are around still are loath to go on strike because if you go on strike, what typically happens at midnight is a fleet of trucks come on a giant repo op operation, you know, haul away all the machinery they can to some new plant being opened in Mexico. And the plant that used to work for for 30 years just got sold to become luxury high rise condo. So, you know, full employment used to be a gateway to higher wages. It no longer has that leverage. In fact, being a job, having a job used to be a gateway to the middle class. Today, having a job is more and more a gateway to poverty because more and more jobs are either at the minimum wage or if you work for Uber or Lyft and are not even considered a worker but an independent contractor, you're paid below the minimum wage. So, yeah, we're at full employment. But full employment doesn't pack the same kind of income punch to the middle class that it did 20, 30 years ago, is my point. So were unskilled laborers working at GM worth what they used to get? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, if you're a shareholder in GM or Magna, no, it's outrageous. And why shouldn't we uh, ship every job we can to Mexico and pay $2.50 an hour? I mean, you know, David, I was the chief economist for an investment bank for 20 years. I get what unit labor costs, the relationship is to earnings per share and share performance. I understand that totally. What labor I arbitrage. <laughs> yeah, it's called yeah. arbitrage. But what allows yeah. you to arbitrage it is the fact that Magna can move its plant to Mexico, produce the very things that it produced in Ontario, and then ship those parts back to Ontario duty-free is what allows that arbitrage to work, okay? So, you know, whose interest was Christia Freeland really representing in the U.S.-Mexican-Canada trade talks? She'll say Canadians, but which Canadians? Magna shareholders? or Magna Canadian workers, because they have diametrically different interests. And the kind of trade deal where Magna or GM can move a factory to Mexico with impunity, that's the kind of trade deal that's in the interests of shareholders, not workers. So today, now, if we want GM 
to have a plant in Ontario or Chrysler or Ford. We can't rely on trade barriers. We have to rely on huge corporate welfare checks to get them to set up production here. And you know what? As a taxpayer, I like the auto pact a whole lot better than handing out huge corporate welfare checks so that companies don't move and do the wage arbitrage to Mexico. So, Jeff, if I could ask you a personal question, when did you come to this epiphany about trade agreements and their impact on when did you come to this epiphany about trade agreements and their impact on workers? Um, I wouldn't quite say it was an epiphany, but if you wanted to trace the evolution of this book, it really started from two papers I did uh, for CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation, where I was, um, um, you know, a senior fellow in the area of trade and energy. The, the first paper was looking at how Canadian auto industry and parts industry did under NAFTA. And it's, you know, it's a story that Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders have both told. And the second yeah. paper was, have Canadian workers been left behind by globalization? Where, you know, I discovered, uh, I discovered that 80% of Canadian households have seen no real income gains for the last two decades. That perhaps is not such a brilliant insight. And most people would, you know, expect that given what's happened elsewhere. What was interesting is that the top, 5% have done even better on an after-tax basis than they have on a tax basis, which means that their tax burden has declined for the last 20 years. And I think that's an interesting result because most Canadians think that we have a very progressive tax system. We do when it comes to wage increases, but the top 1% are the top 1% because of wage income. The top 1% are the top wealth. 1% because they either inherit wealth tax-free, the only G seven country where that's possible or through capital gains of which only 50% is taxed. So if you're a minimum wage worker, hundred percent of your wage income is taxed. If you're Thomas Lutke, uh, the owner of Shopify, only 50% of the billions of capital gains you've made is taxed. To me, that don't sound too progressive. Right. But everything that you're saying looks like it should have been it's so obvious why wasn't it obvious in the 1990s um i mean it was obvious to ross perot he talked about the giant sucking sound of jobs that was gonna uh be heading to mexico but opposition to free trade in the 80s and 90 well the 90s in particular was restricted to fringe elements of the political discourse like ross perot in the united states or like the council of canadians in canada there was no establishment debate about whether or not NAFTA was a good thing. Well, yes and no. Um, think back to the 1988 Canadian election on free trade where John Turner, you know, said, you know, this is the fight of my life, that free trade is going to jeopardize all of Canada's social security system. And he, of course, lost to Mulroney, and that was a trade agreement between two countries that basically had the same income per capita, which is a whole right. different dynamic than when you include Mexico, which has one-tenth. But I'll tell you, in one sense, you're right. There was virtual unanimity among economists that, that free trade was the right thing. And, you know, in economics, ever since David Ricardo published his theory of comparative advantage, which is some 200 years ago, economists have always argued that GDP will be bigger under free trade than any other regime. That's not the issue, David, because as I say, if I'm an expendable, why do I give a shit about GDP? I only give a shit about GDP if I'm a loser and I'm compensated for my losses, okay? Now, in theory, the higher GDP that you get under free trade should allow you to compensate the losers from the gains that go to the winners. But in practice, that hasn't happened. In practice, the reverse has happened. As free trade have thrown more and more people onto the social safety net because they've been displaced by goods from cheap labor countries, the social safety net itself 
has shrunk. Now, the globalists would say, don't blame free trade for the lack of measures to mitigate the distributional impact. But in fact, it's the very freedom of capital to move that prevents you from having the kind of policies that would redistribute income to the losers so no one's worse off. What kind of policies? capital gains tax, inheritance tax, raising the minimum wage, all of those are conditions that would help redistribute income, increasing unemployment insurance. But if a government tries to do that, the response from big business and from the vast majority of economists is that these measures will hurt the very people they're intended to help because they will induce an even greater exodus of capital. So it's a catch-22 that, in fact, you know, the freedom to move is the ability to move when you don't like things that you that you see. And it's trade policy policies that allow you to have that choice. You didn't have that choice in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. You had to deal with your local labor force. And that's that's the difference. A guy named Thomas Frank was on my podcast a couple of years ago. I don't know if you know who he is or not, um, but he's a, a quite an interesting theorist about American politics and the dynamics behind it. And um, he he was talking to me about the army, literal army, of corporate lobbyists and lawyers who are involved in the negotiation of these trade agreements to ensure that corporate interests are protected and advanced in these trade. Is that right? Have you been around this process? Like, how does it happen? He's absolutely right, but let's not let's not think that that's an American phenomena because those corporate interests have cocooned Christia Freeland as well. I mean, whose interest did she represent? She ultimately represented the interest of shareholders in Canadian companies like Magna or Linamar or GM or Ford. And... You know, I mean, is that a surprise? I mean, you know, I mean, she talks the talk. She wrote Well, it is a surprise, Jeff, if I, could, if I could interrupt you. It is a surprise because it is a surprise because uh, the, what you talked about earlier about the middle class and about uh, the fact that middle class hasn't had a wage increase in 30 years and all of that has been accruing to the top 1%. I mean, that was the essential insight behind Trudeau's 2015 campaign for the prime ministership. And it was in part inspired by Christia Freeland and her work on plutocrats and her own work on the middle class. So this is a government that actually, I would suggest, kind of has that thinking in its DNA a little bit. But when it comes to NAFTA, is there any choice? Well, Could the Canadian me, government have opted thing. out of NAFTA? No. Right. Let's draw a distinction between having that DNA in your rhetoric and having that DNA in your policy. Because there's a big difference, David, between what you have in your rhetoric and what you have in your policy. So I guess my question to you would be, what has this liberal government done that professes to champion the middle class, either in tax or trade policy that has redistributed income? And I would argue nothing. I would argue that that trade policy that was signed, okay, allows the deindustrialization of middle class jobs in Canada as much as NAFTA. And if the quid pro quo is, don't worry about that, Jeff, because we'll just write some huge $500 million corporate welfare checks to Ford to keep the plant in Oakville, I have a problem with that because I think that at the end of the day, those corporate welfare checks are going to be paid off, not from the taxes of the 1%, but from the taxes of the very middle class that these measures are professing to help. But in a global world, Jeff, how can Canada act alone on these things? Let's assume everybody agreed with you, and I do agree with you, frankly, but I still don't know what to do because you're talking about a paradigm shift, and Canada cannot affect a paradigm shift. No, it can't. But when Donald Trump offered a uh, Christia Freeland a bilateral trade deal saying that the Canadian issues were tweaking compared to the massive issues that they faced with Mexico. What did Christia Freeland do? She said, no, we want a trilateral deal only to find out that when Trump offered the same deal to Mexico, they went fine. We'll take it. Okay. So <laughs> hello there. Okay. You're right. 
It couldn't have been done unilaterally by Canada, but we had, for the first time in the post-war period, a protectionist populist president in the United States who wanted to protect American jobs. Well, he could have protected American and Canadian jobs if we had a bilateral deal like the auto pack. But of course, if I'm if I'm uh, Magna, I don't want that. Okay. Why not? I don't want to have to bring my factories back from Mexico to Ontario and start paying people twenty to thirty dollars an hour instead of two fifty an hour. So Christia Freeland made sure that Magna wouldn't have to do that. But in this particular case, we did have an opportunity. Whether we still have that opportunity under Biden, you know, that remains to be seen. That's another discussion. Right. Right. Have you been Which paying much attention? Now. Since we're talking about Canadian politics, have you been paying much attention to uh, Aaron O'Toole's rhetoric? Yes. You know, I find it refreshing. I mean, I argue that what we need in Canada is some real choices. We need like a Bernie Sanders dude to lead the NDP. And we need like a Donald Trump dude to lead the conservatives because populism can hit and has hit in the past from both sides of the plate. OK, the trade policies that I'm espousing can be espoused just as easily by Bernie Sanders. And in fact, they were as they were with Donald Trump. So I'd like to see that real debate here instead of the homogenized, globalized type of. Uh, political positions that we see. And I'm seeing some encouraging talk from Aaron O'Toole. And I think he's looked at what Boris Johnson did in the, in the UK, who following up on the Brexit victory, scored the largest conservative majority since Margaret Thatcher by sweeping seats in Northern England that were industrial working class seats that didn't want to see, you know, posted workers and the Polish plumbers, which they won't with the exit from Brexit. So, you know, I think Aaron O'Toole has correctly seen that and go, you know, that constituency, that disenfranchised middle class can easily vote for the Conservative Party as it can for the NDP. Now, I know that the Liberals are claiming to be the champions of the, lib of the middle class, but when Christia F uh, Friedland fails to deliver concrete measures in the November statement that help the middle class, I think that's an opportunity to see real leadership from both Aaron O'Toole and Singh uh, from the NDP. What's a real measure that you would be looking for in the November statement? Oh, okay. Well, let's start with imposing an inheritance tax, okay, on on things that were, um, you know, on estates that were like, you know, 20 million plus, okay? That would be a major source. Like, let me give you an example, okay? Like Thomas Lutka, the guy who owns Shopify, uh, Forbes estimates his estate's worth $8 billion. Let's just say, unfortunately, the dude dies, okay? In tr billionaire friendly Trump America, his estate would have to pay some 40% in inheritance tax, about, you know, roughly about $3 billion. That's Lots equivalent of ways around that, though. What, let me just finish. That's equivalent yeah. to what 125,000 Canadian households pay every year in personal income tax, just to give you some idea. So that would be a real good place to start. Here's another good place to start. The 1% aren't the 1% because of wage income. Okay. So raising the marginal tax rate on the, you know, from 53 to 55 doesn't hurt those folks because that's not the way they make money. They make money through capital gains and dividends. Okay. Let's end the differential favorable taxable treatment of capital gains and dividends compared to wage income. Let's put them on an even keel. She does that, then, okay, she's walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Let's see if she does that. I'll put my money on. It's all talk. So when you say all those things, uh, I like them because especially a wealth tax, I'm fundamentally in agreement with a wealth tax because that's where the disparity is growing. Um, but what about the mobility of capital that we've been talking about through this whole conversation? So when I was, when I was working with Premier Wynne in Ontario, she raised the top marginal, she created a new bracket for income earners over $250,000. And then the Trudeau government came along in 2015 and did the same thing. So there was, so if you were making more than 250, you went over 50% of, uh, you went, your tax rate went over 50%. 
And people went crazy and talked about it being confiscation and stuff. And the officials in the government of Ontario told me that there was already, based on those policies, significant leakage of money out of Ontario, that they were actually losing tax revenue, not gaining it as a consequence. Of that. Okay, well, you said a couple of things there. First of all, I have a lot of sympathy for people who object to marginal tax rates above 50%, because why am I doing this if the government's getting more than half? I don't, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for that. But taxing wealth is a different story. Okay, when you have marginal tax rates above 50%, you create disincentives, the kind of disincentives that aren't healthy for the economy. That's, if I can use an old term, a common sense observation. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about wealth. Now, you raise a very interesting point. I mean, one of the problems with Bernie Sanders, you know, increase in inheritance tax to go up to 75% is folks got to die before you collect, okay? A wealth tax is you can tax their wealth right now. And I think, I think you should. Okay. Now, what about money leaving? Well, yeah, there's a money, a lot of money leaving. It's estimated that 10, 15% of global household income are in tax havens, like places like Panama, places like Belize. And, and in fact, it's not just individuals, companies, you know, have their trademark registered in jurisdictions that don't pay tax. Companies like Apple and Google are free to declare income that they make globally in whatever jurisdiction, not necessarily in the jurisdiction that, that they generate the tax. That's why Dublin has listings that you think it's like London or New York because of their low co corporate tax rate. You know, there's got to be repercussions to countries that want to uh, house tax evasion. And, you know, I think if, if, for, if faced with repercussions, We'll find less homes for those. And the Canadian Revenue Agency, a number one priority of them has to go after offshore accounts. Because when we're going after offshore accounts, we're going after the 1%. We're not people who make minimum wage. They don't do their banking in Panama. You're probably talking about the 0.1%. Uh, or the 0.1%. But, but, but it's, it's basically addressing wealth redistribution. So don't tell. But I if mean, Canada if, did a wealth tax, it wouldn't have to go to it wouldn't have to go to uh, Panama. It could just go to the states that money to hide away from our wealth tax. Uh, it could, it could, and that depends on what happens in the United States. But uh, you know, the interesting thing, David, is that if you look at the conditions that have led to the rise of populism in either the UK or the United States, those same conditions exist in Canada. Like the Canada's middle class has been hollowed out by any benchmark, just as much as the American or British working class. What's different is there has not yet been a populist political expression of that discontented, screwed middle class, as there has been both left and right in the US and with Boris Johnson. So, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. This vacuum will be filled. Whether it's filled from right. the left or the right remains to be seen, but the way Aaron O'Toole's talking, it looks like right now it might be filled from the right, and I think that will be a real challenge to a liberal government that professes to champion the middle class, but in fact serves the interests of the elite. So there's a lot about Trump in your book, Jeff. Yeah. A um, lot about Trump in your book, more than I would have expected because... Well, he was still president story, when I wrote it, by the way. I understand, but in the grand... He, he thinks he's still the president. Um, in, the grand, <laughs> in the grand scheme of this story of the middle class, he's a bit player, isn't he? So why is he so prominent in your book? No, because he's a champion. He's a champion. He's an unlikely champion. Um, and he's transformed the Republican Party into something that many in the Republican Party don't want it to be, which is basically a party of the working class. Now, you know, it's an irony that a gilded billionaire who probably never spent an hour in his life working in a factory has championed the interests of those like no other president in the post-war period. But he's delivered. Like after President Obama, at the end of his term, told American workers that manufacturing jobs would never be coming back, a half a million manufacturing jobs came back. And guess what? 
It wasn't unrelated to the trade policies. And all of a sudden, when firms found that they couldn't just move that factory to Mexico or China because Trump was going to slap them with a tariff, tariff, something happened that hadn't happened in over a decade a real wage increase. Average hourly earnings were growing the fastest they've done over a decade and we're growing at inflation. Now, if you listen to all the economists and all the think tanks that businesses trolled out, they said tariffs will only create higher prices for consumers. They won't create jobs and they won't lead to higher wages. Just like the conventional media calling for the blue wave, they were dead wrong. So that's why. I think Donald Trump deserves some credit, but I'll point out that had the Democrats not stymied Bernie Sanders, had he gone to the White House in 2016, we'd have the exact same trade policies, a trade war with China, a renegotiation of NAFTA that we had under under Trump. So my point being, populism can hit from both sides of the plate, and it, and that could be the case in Canada as well. So one of my problems with right-wing populism on these econ- on these issues, Jeff, is that, you know, I think that one of the great accomplishments of conservative thought, of conservatism over the last few decades has been to convince middle-class people that their enemies are work- or are lower-class people or immigrants as opposed to the 1%. So... Trump's rhetoric all points the finger at the wrong people in terms of who's the villain in this story. Okay, let let me offer a more controversial take than the one that you've just offered on that issue, okay? uh, Trump's views on immigration actually betray the interests of his class because Trump is, after all, a billionaire. The top 1%, not only today, but back in the days of the great age of the Great Migration, where 30 million people came to the United States from 1850 to World War I, the biggest champions of them were the robber barons, people like Carnegie, who referred to them as a stream of gold. Just as today, the biggest, you know, the biggest champions of that are the Koch brothers or the Business Council of National Issues. And the argument, of course, is going to be that with our birth rate, we can't expand the labor force. And without expanding the labor force, we can't have GDP growth. Okay. What happened in the past? Do you remember ever watch that movie Gangs of New York by Scorsese? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Bill the Butcher. Okay, that's in a violent. Case, that's a violent film. That's a violent <laughs> film, and in this case, it were immigrants of the same color and of the same religion. It was Irish folk escaping the potato famine. Okay, and they weren't exactly greeted with open arms by the native labor force. Why? They had good reason to, because what happened was they depressed the wages of local workers, and in fact, in many cases, displaced local workers who were forced to move from coastal cities into the much dangerous hinterland, okay? If you look at who has been affected the most in the U.S. by the increase in immigration since the 1970s, guess who? Black workers, unskilled black workers, last hired, the most likely to be displaced. And in fact, if you look at the participation rate of black adult workers since the 1970s, it's gone steadily down. So not only has it depressed wages, it's dropped them out of the labor force. And when a black man is out of the labor force and hangs out on the streets, bad shit is likely to happen. I'm not exonerating the people who are responsible for the bad shit. I'm just saying there's an economic context here. So you know, is is the interests of workers and immigrants really the same? It hasn't historically. Now, you know, not everybody's affected. Um, You know, if I'm a doctor, if I'm a lawyer, there's like a Royal College of Dentists and a Royal College of Surgeons. You just don't go in and take a job, okay? The, 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 The skilled trades, even in medieval times, have always protected themselves through guilds. And the same thing is true of doctors and lawyers. But there's no like college of unskilled labor to protect unskilled native workers and hence, they're the one who bears the brunt. Now, cheap labor force, 
great for employers. And that's why employer organizations continue to support migration, just like the, the German Employers Association loves posted workers so that workers can come from Eastern Europe and not necessarily have to be paid the German minimum wage, which is the reason why Boris Johnson won all of those seats in Northern England. So that's, so just that's just an alternative take on the issue. That no doubt will have you me branded as a racist xenophobe. But nevertheless, if you look at the historical data, you know, there's a reason why they haven't always been been met with open arms. Right. And are you saying that is it always an is it a long term net drain or a net gain of, of immigration? Like, I mean, what is your point of view about that? Because the argument is always sort of, well, yeah, they may be a little uh, bit of a drain on the economy when they come in, but they're entrepreneurs and they and they get jobs and they grow, they ultimately the economy is stronger because of it. Right, right. And, and again, I guess, David, it's going to go back to um, would GDP grow less with less migration? The answer is yes, no question. Labor is an essential factor of production. So both the quantity and cheapness of labor is going to affect GDP growth. I get back to my earlier comment. The last 30 years, GDP has done just great. Unfortunately, it hasn't meant shit to 80% of middle-income Canadian households. So if your argument to support migration is GDP growth, I'm not going to debate that. I'm not going to challenge that. I'm just going to debate the implicit assumption that you're making higher GDP translates into rising standard of living of the middle class. For decades, that was true. But for the last couple of decades, that's no longer true. There's a fellow in the States named Chris Arnotti, who was a Wall Street uh, investment banker, mm -hmm. <clears throat> who started taking long walks to ease the tension of his job. And he started walking into Manhattan neighborhoods that people like him weren't supposed to walk into. And he became more interested in those neighborhoods than in his job. And he ultimately quit his job and went around the States to the poorest small communities or neighborhoods of large communities and hung out with the people there and ultimately documented them in a book called Dignity, which is a really important book for understanding the class of people you're talking about, the left behind, the expendables. He has a theory that the great divide in our society now is uh, over education and that we have created a credential around education that is exclusionary and which condemns a large segment of the population to being on a track that is to nowhere. Um, and that uh, they don't have any pathway to even join what we want to join if they wanted to join it. Um, and it doesn't in any way value people who decide that they want to stay in their home community and take care of their parents and live in the same town they grew up in. And that we've created this caste system around education. In, in his view, America. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's an interesting perspective. I have a somewhat different perspective on the issue. I agree that that education has become a huge schism. If you look at like the Trump support, it generally comes from people who don't have a college education, whereas Biden, the opposite. Uh, but what has education got us? I mean, the millennials, were the most educated cohort in the post-war period. And they were because their parents, people like us, would have invested so heavily in their education because people like us, based on our own experience, thought that their the incomes of their children would be based on how educated they were. And what do we find? The millennials, for the most part, are poor than their parents. In fact, they're the first generation in the post-war cohorts that are so. They're the most educated, but all that education has left them with are record student loans. Because instead of it necessarily being a passport to a higher paying job, what it simply has meant is that they are the most educated labor force in history to do essentially menial jobs. So yes, education is seen as a schism. Um, education is certainly something or the lack of university education that is sort of 
a telltale characteristic of the expendables. But if people who are ed who have a university education and vote for the liberals in Canada or vote for the Biden Democrats in the United States, thinking that they're going to come with policies that will support them, just look at how well millennials have done over the last 20 years and compare them to your parents and ask, what kind of return have I got? on this education that my parents have bought me or that I have basically borrowed through student loans. All right. All right, Jeff, let's, let's come to Jesus here, right? I'm you sure. and I, in our own, you and I, in our own individual ways, both played some role in cementing this neoliberal framework that we have through our work. What's a pathway out of it? Well, as I, I say, a pathway out of it is to understand the policies that put us in here and re-engineer those policies. And the two critical things, and they're tied together, but the two critical things that have to be done is change trade policy and trade tax policy. And when you do that, okay, you redistribute income. And when you redistribute income, there's pushback, okay? there's very significant pushback. So the 1% in this country aren't just going to go, well, you know, we've had our day. It's time to share. That's not the way it's going to work. Okay, There's going to be very significant pushback. And the top 1%, for the most part, have a disproportionate amount of influence in the media. Okay, so, you know, I, I understand, like, you know, if Christia Freeland's listening to this, she said, hey, Jeff, it's not so easy to just bring in an inheritance tax. And, you know, I get that, but things aren't going to change until policies like that are implemented. So it's on the tax and it's on and it's on the trade. And, and if your point is that in an open economy, it's hard to do that with other countries not doing it. We had a great opportunity. We missed our opportunity, but who knows which way Biden will go because, you know, the 70 million expendables who voted for Trump, they're not going away. They're going right. to be heard one way or another. Right. Well, I've got you here. I just have to ask you as an economist and as uh, an observer of public policy, what is your feeling about government spending and debt levels in Canada right now? and what's affordable and not affordable. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, your old mentor, uh, Paul Martin, I believe, would have uh, built his reputation on that. Uh, at the time, I was the chief economist of CIBC. We didn't really see eye to eye, but that doesn't matter. Um, we're in deficit creation mode, and we're going to see deficits the size of which we haven't seen since World War II as a portion of the economy. We will soon go into deficit reduction mode and deficit reduction mode will be cutting uh, expenditures and raising taxes. Let's see who, who carries that tax burden. You know, in the 2009-2010 financial crisis, it wasn't Wall Street who paid for the bailout. It was Main Street who paid for Wall Street's bailout. Who's going to pay for this 350 to $500 billion deficit? The expendables or the 1%? When it comes to trade policy, the middle class is viewed as expendable. But when it comes to deficit reduction, believe me, the middle class will be uppermost on Christia Freeland's mind. Well, that's a mic drop, Jeff. I think we should probably call it, uh, call okay. it a day there. Uh, okay. This was a fascinating discussion, and I'm so glad you're out there because there aren't enough voices that are challenging these economic orthodoxies that are driving exactly the societal fissures, disparities, and unfairnesses that you talk about. So, ladies and gentlemen, the book is called The Expendables, and it's by Jeff Rubin. And pick it up. It's a great read. There's a lot of this stuff being written around the world, but this has a particular Canadian perspective and bent to it that makes it extremely valuable. Jeff, uh, very feel very privileged to have had you on this morning. Thanks for your Thanks time. Thanks very much. And if you don't mind, uh, I understand you're connected. Say hi to Terry O'Leary. I haven't seen her in years, but we used to know each other. Um, we were on different sides. Yeah, we're kind of connected. Okay. Well, she was Paul Martin's CEA, <laughs> and Martin and I, you know, we had our thing. But anyway, just say hi to her. I haven't seen her in, in years. 
I will. And she uh, she actually asked me to to, uh, to offline say hi to you, and I forgot to do that. So I'll say it right here online. Terry was thinking about you too. Okay. So, exactly 25 years ago today, on November 17th, 1995, the Canadian government sold CN. It was a big deal. As we've told you, CN was once the grizzly bear of Crown Corporations. It was big, it was ponderous, it was hungry, it was fat, and it was grouchy. Either you did things CN's way, or you found another shipper. Selling it off went against the very DNA of the Liberal Party. But it is uncontroversial today to say that it was the best thing that ever happened to the railroad, and pretty good for the Canadian economy too. The government took in $2.25 billion from the sale at a time when it desperately needed revenue. And the sale freed CN from its political harness. It was finally free to compete, to innovate, and to deliver value. It added another coast to its network. CN acquired railroads in the United States, expanding its network all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And because of NAFTA, it was able to seamlessly integrate its new American operations. CN is now an innovator. It is an uncontested leader in efficiency. No railroad makes better use of technology. And 25 years after it entered the unforgiving free market, CN believes it is owed nothing and it takes nothing for granted. Performance, safety, and customer service are the prime directives. I want to say one more thing here. As I've told you, I was a senior advisor to the finance minister in the early 90s, and I was in the rooms where the decision to sell was made. I'll confess that like most people, I was a bit skeptical at the time. But if I'd bought $1,000 worth of CN stock the day it first went on sale, it would be worth about $63,000 today. Stock analysts have a term for growth like that. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. CN is a Canadian success. And what a lovely topic that is. All right, here we are with the panel. Jenny Byrne, Scott Reed. Welcome back this week. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. Jenny, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing very good. How about you? You're, I'm all right. You're at home? I am at home. In Not Toronto. in your office today? No, nope, I'll go yeah. into the office after I uh, after we tape this. Oh, okay. Scott, have you left your home in a while? Not much, really. Um, as you can tell by my skin color, I spend a lot of time underground uh, in the basement, <laughs> just sitting here, reading old comics, uh, you know, drinking uh, cleaning product. Uh, you know, I'm just, uh, I, I, I think I am starting to, you know what you went through in March, Jenny, and we were in the, I think I'm hitting that grinder spot. Like I've, I've actually quite busy with work these days, so it's keeping me going which means that I'm stuck on Zooms one after another, which burn not only my eyes out, but my soul out of my head. <laughs> and I don't know, like, I'm like, I can't, I'm not, I'll sleep for two hours and I wake up and I, I like last night is a good example. I dreamt last night that I took my water Brita, you know, like the Britas, you know, I took the water Brita, I undid the top, I took out the filter and then I spilled water all <laughs> over my counter. I don't know what that dream means. I'm sure there are people out there that do dream interpretation. I'm sure it's, something that speaks to my sexual inadequacies, but it just, I woke up and I just felt despondent. I'm like, fuck, I spilled water everywhere. I just can't do a goddamn thing right. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that's maybe more of an answer you were looking for, Dave, but I'm doing fine, getting by, you know. <laughs> Work a day, one foot in front of the other. That's my philosophy. It's, so it's funny, it's, I've had other friends and it's actually more of my friends that have kids that how I felt kind of March, April, the first bit of May, you guys are all there now. Like I will talk to a good friend of mine and he'll call me every day and we have a chat and then he'll like the call will end and he'll go, fuck this. And then he'll like, just hang up the phone. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Weather's getting colder. I'm getting yeah. older. Nothing's getting better. Well, Scott, Scott sounds like he's in tough shape, Jenny. You're in Toronto. Maybe you want to keep an eye on him to make sure he's okay. He is still, however, providing... Advice to clients at uh, high premium rates. So, presume, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> it's on the octet early. <laughs> so, hey, just I want a heads up. We did a live event for CJ Pack this past week. It was a lot of fun, but my connection failed twice. So, hopefully, we'll get through this show uh, with my uh, satellite-based internet system holding up. Anyways, I heard you guys were really good on the well, usually, lots of good feet. 
You only, you only like, you, we only lost you for what, five minutes, 10 minutes? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Enough that all the comments about the show were really just about the two of you. I'm a, I, w I was effectively not there. You were, I'm feeling very badly about it, really, as you can tell. Don't feel bad. I would have um, been, ha I would have, it would have been to my reputational benefit had my uh, Wi-Fi gone out because I, I told a story that was 27 minutes long and uh, 90 <laughs> seconds sensible. So it was, uh, I don't know what I was on about. It was grim. It was about Stephen Harper awesome. and homosexuality, wasn't it? Yeah, I stopped. Uh, I stopped halfway through that story in my mind and frantically said to myself, what are you doing? Where are you going? Suspend your mouth. Halt it. Quit talking. You moron. And, blah, blah, blah. and then this happened and homosexual and Harper, same sentence. And anyway. Yeah, well, I really story. didn't know where you were going. I really could not tell where you were going with that. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I have to rant. I, did I have to rant, you guys. Even though mm. I'm up at my cottage and not part of the weirdness that you're involved in in Toronto, I have to rant. COVID. We can't live with it. We can't stop talking about it, the group of us. this The national effort against COVID has now broken down into a series of failed patchwork efforts across the country, with the exception of the Atlantic bubble. No governments want to stand up and lead or take accountability for what's going on. Because there are no clear objectives of policy, the communications is muddled as hell. Nobody knows the rules anymore, at least here in Ontario. Testing levels are well below where they need to be, yet positives have outstripped the capacity of contact tracers. Schools are outbreak centers. Long-term care homes are yet again a tragic, horrific story. Can we hang on until a vaccine? And where is this going in the next few months, you guys? Well, I, 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 I think there's no choice. What do you mean? Can we hang on till there's a vaccine? What choice do we have? Well, I mean, I think things are falling apart. Like the numbers all across the country, they're, they're very disturbing. The numbers, the numbers are higher. Hospitalizations aren't, uh, aren't where the modelers are saying, uh, saying they are. So people that are getting it aren't hospitalized. And, they, and it may not even just be people that are getting it aren't as uh, uh, you know, aren't, aren't as vulnerable to, to the virus. That, that I'm assuming that over the last nine months, hospitals and doctors and, and how we treat this has also become, uh, we've also gotten better at doing that as yeah, well. Sure. So that's probably why hospitalizations aren't as, uh, aren't as, aren't as high. Well, I wouldn't take yeah. too much comfort in that. I mean, hospitalization rates are increasing. Like today, the front page of the newspaper is about sick kids, the head of sick kids saying, guys, uh, we're, we're already at overcapacity. So, and you've made this point for months, Jenny, you know, so other pr procedures other than COVID crisis are now so badly delayed uh, that you're getting all sorts of uh, secondary health uh, challenges. And by he health challenges is too banana phrase. You're getting people who aren't getting surgeries that they need. So on and on yeah. and on. And I think that's only going to intensify because, you know, we've, we've only had a week of tests that are in the, um, you know, of cases that are in the 1,300, 1,400, if it goes to 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, you know, one just has to, like, you know, day follows night, night follows day, hospitalization rates will increase, and that is going to get overwhelmed, and we've seen it in the states where that was the trend in, uh, you know, you think of a place like Wisconsin. So I, I'm with you, David. I'm alarmed by it, and, you know, I, th I think it's inevitable. I think the failure of governments, and I, don't, I mean, we, I, I'm repeating myself, but the failure of governments take advantage of the summer um, – period to put in place effective uh, tracing, to uh, accommodate appropriately for the return to school, to deal with long-term care in a sustainable way. Uh, and I think maybe increasingly what's bugging me is, is, is to have moved on rapid testing. I think all those things are coming back to haunt us and they're going to make for a long, very locked down winter because the inability to make surgical moves results in, well, we don't know what else to do, and no, we can't defend it inch by inch, mile by mile in terms of transmission pla uh, placement, but we have no choice but to bring the full boot down. So the boot's going to come down, and we're all going to be uh, hunkered inside, and there's no alternative because there's no, there's no alternative strategy. And the one thing, we talk about vaccines, and I, that is good news. But that's that's a year away from now. Good news. It's it's not really spring good news. Like it's going to take a long time for that to get distributed. The effort that's going to be required to procure, produce, distribute worldwide to a point where we can like wander around and say it's something like normal. Like we are talking a year, two years, and so 
where is the rapid testing? Like we need the rapid testing. We need the bridge and the bridge is called rapid testing. And I, I don't hear about it. I don't see anything about it. And so that, that, that frustrates me. Yeah. The federal government should move on approving rapid testing. Well, they've Didn't they approve some, it, right? Jenny? Like, where are, the, where are the bloody tests? I thought they approved them and bought them. I thought there were millions of tests bought. After where that. are they? No, but, 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 but we haven't gotten our full allotment yet because we're behind uh, other countries in terms of uh, where we were in the queue in terms of buying this, which is what we talked about uh, in terms of not only that, but vaccines, Scott. You said that I was I was We're not. We're I ahead on vaccines. We have more vaccines. I, I, the, that's just not true. Okay. All right. Let's. Let's see, let's it's see it's not true. We have All more. Right. We have purchased. We have purchased more vaccines on more platforms. The argument that's going to be made months from now is that we overspent betting on vaccines that never turned out because we made so many bets on the board. No and other country has made as many bets in as many places and has as many doses secured as we have per capita. Anyone and when in the are world. we getting? And when are we getting them? Well, I, I can't get the. How do you get the vaccines? They don't exist yet, but we know that we have actually had a couple of horses come in. So that, but my point is, it's going to take a long time for that to come. And so it's a test that we know, like, I'm wondering where are the tests that have been approved that have been purchased? Where are those? I don't know. So you could ask your friends in the liberal government. Do you see the same things that I'm seeing folks in terms of governments now walking away from wanting to lead on this in April, everybody was rushing up to a mic. March and April, everybody was rushing up to a mic to issue their reassuring words and get their congratulations for how maturely and well they were handling it. But now, you know, I don't see anybody that really wants to be in charge of this thing. Well, because I think they're, they're, they have, I think all governments got a bit of a pass. We talked about this numerous times in March, April, May, uh, when no one really, when we all thought this was kind of, uh, we were all in this for the short term or the short haul. And uh, no one really understood much about the virus, and governments were given a bit of a free pass. And now, and now they're finding they're uh, now they're finding they're not uh, they're not getting a free pass. That you know we've been going into our tenth month of um, uh, of dealing with uh, COVID uh, on different on different levels, and and uh, uh, people expect their politicians to answer questions. To Scott's point, as to what they've been doing over the last six months, um, because if if w where we're at right now, we have we have to live with this in some capacity so governments have to governments have to adapt on all le levels as to how we're going to uh how we're going to live on this live with this look i i think only true dummies like trump didn't read um the writing on the wall in the spring all it really required was uh, a note of moral leadership look we got a big battle we got to come together we got to do the right thing and we're going to do it uh, and government after government, premier after premier, governor after governor was rewarded for saying those things. Now you're being judged on a different measuring stick. Now governments are being judged on the basis of choices made um, and consequences felt. And, you know, that's that's tougher territory. And since people don't know where it's going, since you're, you're you don't know, I mean, the most the scariest thing in government you know, we all know this. Politics fundamentally is about expectations management. Imagining where the finish line is and trying to position yourself as well as possible to get there at the right time in conjunction with what expectations are. And you can't manage expectations for this thing because you don't know where that finish line is or what that finish line looks like. So everyone's starting to shrink back. Um, and and in, in particular, like, I, I just think, you know, with Ford, you have a situation where he's like, I think I'd like to download... Um, the decision for lockdowns on a regional basis. And you can make a rational policy argument why you need to go on a regional basis, and that's supportable. But really, I think at this point, we've gotten into a world of, I want to keep as much of the political grief off of me. And if I hear Doug Ford give one more press conference, he talks about how tough this is on him and how he's rolling over at night trying to like, you know, make decisions and balance choices. I don't give a shit. However tough it is for you, it's way tougher for the person who's sitting at a bedside waiting to see, you know, if one of their loved ones is going to make it or not. So it's uh, politicians, they got but tough but jobs right now. But, but, but media and people like you guys gave politicians the free ride. If you'll remember, I never actually thought uh, the politicians were doing a good job in the in the spring. I actually wanted to see more action that they were, than what they were doing. But yes. you guys thought it was. You great. did. You, you, okay, you we did. were bad. For me, you were the good. Great For me, the great mystery is the summer. The the what I call the lost summer of COVID in Canada. Like I don't know what governments were doing. That any of them at at, I, at any level. 
But, you know, Scott, you were talking about Ford wanting to push decision-making down, and you could argue that there's a rationale for municipality-by-municipality decision-making on this. But at the same time, there's pressure for the federal government to play more of a leadership role. And a lot of people are calling for the feds to step up and, and, and bring some sort of national coherence to this approach, either through the use of their emergency measures in the extreme version, or as Anime Paul said, something as simple as convening a FedProv meeting to try to develop a, a national strategy about it. I don't, I don't know where that would lead with so many diverse viewpoints out there. I don't know what the value of bringing Jason Kenney to a meeting is. But, um, but nonetheless, you know, I mean, I'm attracted to this notion of federal intervention, but that's because I'm the kind of person who, when I don't like the decisions that provincial governments make, I, I get less fussy about sections 91 and 92 of the Constitution and uh, become more willing for the government that I agree with to, to, uh, to do whatever it needs to do. So I understand that it's probably not the federal government's role, but nonetheless, I'm attracted to the idea of more federal leadership on this. Well, I don't think we're going to see it. We haven't. I don't know why they would change course as, uh, now. I think we, we will see more rhetoric on this as we get closer to what I think is going to be a spring election because I, I can't I can't fathom how um, there's there's not going to be one based on uh, uh, based on uh, where I see the economy uh, going over the next uh, uh, over the next six to eight months. So I, I think we've already seen the rhetoric change. Trudeau's press conference. Uh, uh, I think it was Thursday or Friday of last week, he only singled out one province and that was Ontario. And if you actually just look now at the metrics, um, Ontario has 85 COVID cases per 100,000 people. Uh, Manitoba has 490. Um, uh, both uh, Alberta and BC are well in the hundreds. So if you actually are looking at true metrics right now, uh, in terms Ontario's of- Ontario is one of the best uh, in the country in right cases, now. Ontario is one of the best in the country. So this it's obvious that that this is Trudeau pre-positioning in terms of he plans to fight the next election, uh, not solely, but he will fight the next election uh, campaigning against uh, against Doug. Maybe we'll see. Before we get there, I've got another question. And I think, you know, we talked about federal leadership. Um, I mean, I think there are some things that uh, I would I'm, I wouldn't be honest if I sat here today and said that if I was in the prime minister's office, I'd be saying, okay, guys, let's, let's impose the war measures act. Let's go to emergency measures. I just don't think that I would be recommending that. I don't think that, um, that, that would uh, be justifiable on either a policy or a political basis. But, um, but one opportunity to lead for sure is going to be an economic statement that's supposed to come. And you notice it's gotten goddamn quiet about the economic statement. It was it was actually populating in the language and dialogue and conversation of federal politics like a month ago. Um, but it's kind of quieted down. And so my guess is, and I don't have any idea, I haven't talked to anybody. but We've my come guess a long way, Scott, if I could just say, we, we've come a long way from the hype around the government's agenda for this fall that accompanied prorogation. That's right. It was going to be a brand new plan to remake Canada. Let's make sure that this crisis doesn't get wasted. But all that's better. gone. All that's gone to rat shit. Um, so now it's about managing. And actually, ironically, if you believe the polls, it show that the government has had a bit of an uptick federally in recent days. And then you look back at March, you'd say to yourself, you know, why do you guys want to have this big ambitious agenda anyway? It seems like they do better when they're just trying to manage the day to day of saying, OK, we're trying to focus in the right place, focus on the right things. But I, the economic statement, my guess is it's going to get pushed a little bit later because the environment is changing so rapidly right now. I think, you know, it was going to be an economic statement that would say this is what the outlook is, maybe a couple of measures. Now, I wonder if you're going to have to have an almost an emergency budget. We're going to be back to if 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 whole parts of the country are going to have to contemplate like real lockdown, then you're back into a world where you're going to have to start to pay businesses uh, of all sorts uh, to not send people to work. And so it isn't just the instruments of CERB and, and wage subsidy. You're going to see an airlines package. When you get an airlines package, you're going to get the energy industry saying, what about us? You get the energy industry, you're sure as shit going to get the retail sector saying, whoa, 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 if you're going to shut down and not permit people to come into our stores or only one by, you know, in groups of two or three, then we're going to need support. And, and that's going to happen. Like it's all of those things are going to occur, it seems to me, this winter. So I think you're going to see an economic statement that edges into December. And, and I have a feeling it might be, big, like solar system big, like the numbers that we've talked about so far, I think we're going to have to say, all right, we're, we're spending billions uh, to ask businesses to stay afloat, not fire people, um, but not do 
their jobs either. And um, but that's, that's what we're talking about in March, and I think we're back to it. And but I think it's not, going to be bigger this time. But that's not sustainable, and Trudeau is actually even prepositioning that it's not sustainable. So I think that's why he's going to want to have an election before we hit that. So we're a country, we have the highest deficit to GDP, uh, the IMF says, in the in the entire G20. You love the G20, Scott, so I thought I'd throw that stat out. I do love the G20. Um, I'm sad for its uh, absence these days. Um, and uh, in the second quarter, household income uh, in Canada went up by 11% because government was subsidizing people, uh, people staying at home. And so I don't. I just don't think it's sustainable, and I even. I think even the liberals know it's not sustainable. So I don't think we need an emergency budget. I think we need a budget because we're close to two years of not having one. We're we're a, a G seven country where we have not had a budget in uh, close to twenty four months. Uh, so I think there should be a budget. I just don't think it's going to be all that. Uh, I don't think it's. I think it's going to be more of the same. It's going to be another extending the wage subsidy, uh, which just ex- extends businesses not uh, restructuring, which puts off. Uh, unemployment, but I think that uh, the spring and the fall are going to be much different places to where Canadians' mindset is, and and, and I think the government is probably uh, I may be giving them more credit than they deserve, but I think they're sitting and they know that, and they are trying to figure out exactly what uh, what they can fiscally get away with in terms of uh, can't be that. I, I hear you, but, and I know I'm putting pressure on the government, so this is the opposite of a partisan response. But um, I don't think that's um, you can say it's not sustainable, um, but if the government, if we have widespread lockdowns in places like uh, Ontario and Quebec, and if industry and retail has to shut down, particularly retail, obviously, like really shut down again, um, there's no policy choice. The government has had one fundamental talking point. The federal liberals have had one fundamental talking point since this thing started. And, and they've taken the grief from people like David who said, what's your fiscal anchor? And the response has been, we'll do whatever it takes. We are in a fire drill and we will do whatever it takes. And you can't pivot off of that. And you sure as shit are not going to pivot off of it as governments are going, as whole jurisdictions are going into lockdown. So I hear what you're saying, but this notion of sustainability, it's going to get washed away like, uh, like smoke in the wind. And uh, we're going to see we're, we're going to see checks get written uh, because there's no other way. Otherwise, unemployment is going to skyrocket and businesses are going to fail. And if the government's talking about bailing out the airline sector, which I think is reasonable, then it's going to have to do so much more broadly. Yeah, you can't do airlines and not restaurants, I don't think. Um, so there's going to there's going to have to be something for retail and hospitality. I would I would assume. Um, I just want to um, conservative premiers in Canada, whether that's Ford or Legault or even Pallister have ultimately come around to reluctantly, but come around to embracing lockdown measures. Well, Ford's always embraced the lockdown f- me- measures, David. What the fuck is going on with Jason Kenney? Why is the government of Alberta so resistant to actually fighting this virus in the way that everybody else has fought it? But what I don't is think, their theory? What is their belief system? Of I don't think that's fair. I think Jason's Jason is making the determination that he that he can't. This is a province that was already uh, hit uh, with a lot of economic pressure leading into COVID with uh, with the uh, uh, with the collapse of oil prices. And he's making responsible decisions because he's not just talking to healthcare uh, uh, practitioners. He's also talking to uh, he's talking to businesses and and others. And so he's making the determination. I don't I don't think it's fair at all to. Uh, to say that uh, that he's not taking this seriously, because there's no pr- like there's so this is the thing he's not putting in place the he's not putting in place the kind of restrictions on movement and lockdown and there's all this talk about okay, personal but responsibility what but the cases are out of control. Okay, well not not as out of control as places in Manitoba. So I think it's just 112 right. people per uh, 100,000. But what what do you suggest? What do you suggest they do? What what do you suggest they do? What haven't? What is? What what is different in Alberta than than what what Scott and I live with in Ontario right now? And Scott and I are a bit different because John Tory has put on additional restrictions. But you can go. Well, both restaurant. Saskatchewan and Alberta have lots of places that don't have mask mandates, for one thing. Um, and uh, that's both ineffective and confusing. Uh, second of all, the 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 curfew, lockdown rules around bars and restaurants are laughably unstrict. No, it's at, 10, um, it's at it's at 10 p.m. It's the same as here and in, in British Columbia. 
You can't buy, you, bars close down at 11, restaurants close at 11, you stop serving alcohol at 10. So, and, and by the way, masks are municipal, that they're municipal. It was a guideline here in Toronto where you had to do a mask. So you're letting your hatred for Jason Kenney cloud the fact that he's doing essentially what every other premier has been doing. I actually don't hate Jason Kenney. I, I know him. I don't hate him. I don't hate him, but I know him to be a very particular type of intellectual conservative. And I'm just trying to understand. Okay, but I'm just, I'm telling you what, where Alberta is right now in terms of provisions is almost no different. Like the most lockdown province we have right now is Manitoba. Like there, there, Manitoba is where we were in, in, in April. Well, that's because Manitoba right. didn't experience the first wave. So they were spared from it. Now they're, and I'm not saying this like it's an accusation. I'm like, they were fortunate enough to be spared from it. And now all of a sudden, because basically if you're going to be hospitalized and get surgery, that happens in Winnipeg, poof, um, the stakes went from, you know, nothing to everything very, very quickly. I, I, I have a different, uh, uh, set aside the measures. I, I for sure think that you detect from the likes of Jason Kenney, and I, and I don't dislike Jason Kenney. Um, I don't agree with him politically, but I don't dislike him personally at all. So I'm not motivated by some kind of personal animus. Um, but I, I'm in a world where I, I think I hear from Jason Kenney a reluctance and a resistance and a frustration that you don't hear from other political leaders necessarily. And it's like, I, 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 it runs against what is necessary to protect public health, or as best we can tell what it might take to protect public health, runs against the grain of his brand of conservatism, which is individual choice, freedom. I'm not going to put constraint on you. I've told you for 40 years that government is the problem, not the remedy. And it, I think one of the things that the pandemic has revealed is fundamental beliefs in the role of government. What is your fundamental belief in the role of government? Is it something you say, you know what, I, 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 when, when the chips are down, I need it. I need collective action. I need, I need broad-based government guidance. I have to have rules that people tell me do and don't do. Um, or is your view, you know, I, I, I'm going to fight that to the last straw. And, and, and you know, I, I, I just think that, that no, fundamental no. tension is being exposed very clearly. No, no, you're talking about tone and tenor. You guys want people to what to, to, to be warm and fluffy? Because that's that's not, I actually don't think that's what we want from our government leader. I, if I hear one more fucking politician tell me we're all in this together, I'm going to like throw something across the room. So you're talking about tone and tenor. It's, 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 it, it infuriates me, for example, in the States. You've got Governor DeSantis where uh, uh, he, he is being... Uh, pillared for his handling of it. And it, Governor Cuomo has wrote, wrote a book about how to get through a crisis. And he's killed, he, his decisions killed people. He was putting pe COVID patients from long-term care facilities back in long-term care facilities and not in hospitals, which then, which then it, 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 it was spreading like wildfire. So you're talking about tone. You're not talking about actions. I'm sorry, I don't agree. I am not talking just about tone, but I am saying that for sure it comes through in tone and talk, whether you are comfortable saying that government has to be the net, government has to be the bulwark. And I think, you know, it's harder for conservatives and particularly certain kinds of conservatives who have spent since the Reagan years telling people that government is not to be trusted. And then if government touches something, then they fuck it all yeah. up. And now so we're having to say government needs to be there to provide guidance to people, bullshit. to provide regulations and, no, and, and, and to say we're going to stroke these checks. That's that's absolutely bullshit, because if you okay. look at Prague, OK, uh, the NDP premier of British Columbia uh, just got reelected with a massive majority and had some of the uh, lowest levels of uh, lockdown in the uh, uh, lockdown in the entire country. So you are talking about tone and tenor. No, I'm not. I'm talking about confused messages from political leaders who, if they even when they take certain steps, they do it slower, they do it reluctantly, and they confuse the signals they send that publicly. Has take a look at what's happened in Alberta. That has been true. Kenny has Kenny has pointed out things that he doubts about the uh, guidance, and you know, and then you see, like and obviously what? the more extreme versions like of what? it are where Scott? we see governors in the United like States. Like what, Scott? What has he pointed out that he? What? what He's exactly? resisted talk of masking for sure. Let's put the app. Let's put the app. Like the I app don't know if that COVID app is worth a damn. Mine has never gone off. No, but Bonnie. But what's but the Bonnie, harm? But but the, but but Bonnie Henry said it's it's it completely ineffective. So basically, if you're around someone for. 15 minutes or more within two meters, you get uh, you get like some notification that could be someone sitting exactly two to three meters away from you and you're going to get an app that you've been exposed. It sounds like 
we're looking for reasons to not do it as opposed to reasons to do it, even if we acknowledge it's imperfect. That's what I'm talking about. And it's not just tone. It sets a standard and, 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 and it sets a direction. And I think it's born of a way of looking at it. You know, I, I'm sorry, but, you know, again, I keep going back to it. Conservatives have told people for 40 years that you can't rely on government and that government fucks stuff up and don't trust government. Well, now we all need government. We might need it for a check or we might need it for guidance or we might need it for consistency and messaging with respect to things like public health activity. And, you know, it's harder to get there, you know, if, if you've dedicated your entire adult life to saying government doesn't get it right. You know, I would just like to have a clear policy somewhere. I'd just like to know what we're trying to do now. Like, I <clears throat> I don't know even how to judge anything. Are we trying to eradicate this virus? Are we trying to flatten the curve again? Are we trying to keep ERs open? I don't know what we're trying to do. Do you know what we're trying to do? No. Uh, well, no. You, see, you see health professionals say, like, it's all... Uh, it's all uh, uh, COVID zero uh, all over social media. And that's just not, it's not practical. And that's why you're right. seeing a growing resistance with people um, who, by the way, are uh, following the rules. Like it's, it's not a partisanship, Scott, thing, Scott. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that people, people right now, the vast majority of people, um, they're, they're wearing their masks when they go out. Um, they're following the rules. They're happy. Their kids are at school. They're worried about their, um, they're worried about their parents. But this is where governments need to step up. So if there's going to be a national strategy, Trudeau's ultimately going to have to uh, step up. But governments like municipalities. So, for example, if we are going to lock down again, and I sure as hell hope we don't um, I go through a full lockdown again, then if these people having parties, and I actually have no problem with people having parties, but let's say that is where the community spread is coming. And, and governments are making the decision to take away people's paychecks and their livelihoods and their lives because there could be a bailout for the restaurant sector and it's probably not going to help. Uh, uh, it, it's going to come way too little too late. Uh, then, then politicians have to make the, the determination to start actually enacting these fines on people that are actually breaking the rules. So it can't be two sets yeah. of rules for, uh, for people. So if, I, I, like if John Tory wants to lock us down or if Bonnie Crombie and Patrick Brown and... Uh, Alan Thompson, the mayor of Caledon, they want to lock down Peel, then if there's big parties happening in Peel that everyone hears about on the news, then they have to go in and start enacting like major fines on, on, on yeah. them. Because that, that's my, my, and I don't even personally, agree, I personally don't even support that. But, but if they're going to lock down, that's the kind of stuff politicians, it's every level of government just keeps batting this to each other. The municipal governments are batting it to the provinces, provinces are batting it back to the municipalities, Trudeau's batting it to everyone. So they're going to have to actually have to make those kind of decisions. Yeah. I agree with that. All right. I agree with that strongly. And I think, we I, take, I think well, we are th there you that. go. I'm just going to, you know what, for Scott, Scott, I'm just going to take that and run with it that I agree <laughs> with it strongly. I'm just going to take that and I'm going to put it in the bank. Um, we have to take a break, a quick break for a new sponsor of the Hurley Burley podcast. It's about space. Right on. I love space. I know. I can't wait to get I'll there. I'll be right back. Um, that's my, that's my COVID plan. <laughs> I'll be right back after I talk about space for a minute. When we think of Canada and space missions, what's the first thing that comes to mind? For a lot of you, I'm betting it's the Canada arm. Remember the photos, the red maple leaf against that vast sea of blackness? Well, there's a hell of a lot more to the story. It starts in 1969 with a wholly owned Canadian company called McDonald, Detweiler & Associates now known as MDA. Theirs is a 51-year history as an international space mission partner and a robotics, satellite systems, and geo-intelligence pioneer. Like any leader, it's a story of firsts. Canada is the first country with a domestic communication satellite in orbit because of MDA's contributions. They beat NASA engineers in the race to process the first image from CSAT, the world's first radar remote sensing satellite. The Hubble Space Telescope? Canada Arm deployed it. MDA launched the world's first commercially focused radar satellite. They built a meteorological station on Mars, invented Dexter, a dual-armed robot for the International Space Station. And MDA has just been tapped for the third generation, Canada Arm, for a lunar orbiting space station. I just cherry-picked a few of over 50 firsts. Now, they're leading the charge toward viable moon colonies, enhanced Earth observation, and communication in a hyper-connected world. 
MDA isn't just Canada's largest space technology developer and manufacturer. They grow our economy and they advocate for an entire industry. A space company with a big Canadian flag on their backpack. You can find out more about them at www.mda.space. All right, we're back and that's enough COVID. Let's, let's move to something less controversial. Let's look down south. The election down south. Is that thing over yet? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, I, I don't think I have nothing <laughs> different to say than what I said last week. Yeah, I got well, no. Fr- okay, no, here's no, the. But uh, sorry, go ahead, David. Pardon me. Yeah, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say, Trump looks incredibly pathetic and ridiculous with his palace guard now reduced to Rudy and his family, <laughs> and you know, there's no nothing seeming impressive around him. But so it could look like a beer hall putsch if you just looked at Trump. But. The entire Republican establishment is largely resisting the results of this election. What's the game plan? Well, I think they probably, from anything you've read, they've 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 conceded privately that uh, that that Trump has won. But I think he's such a force uh, right now within the Republican Party that if people are thinking about in two years down the road or four years down the road, um, uh, it's not worth making the uh, uh, the enemy. So I think uh, for the most part, I would say. I don't think they're resistant. I think they're just being quiet. And I think the vast majority of resources are still probably headed. If they're not already there, they're headed to Georgia for the runoff ballot on, on runoff ballots on January 5th. So I, I think there's right. one big lesson from this in terms of uh, what we see out of Trump, how the Republicans are responding to that. And, and I hope, I, I don't know if we have a big, listenership among children but if there are young people out there i hope i hope that they take this lesson to heart okay be a fucking liar okay that's what i really think you need to withdraw be a fucking liar people because because if you're a fucking liar people will call you a liar daniel dale will go on twitter and he'll say how many times you've lied and 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 people like us and a big mouth monkey like myself will call you names and say, ha, 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 you're a liar. And you have a guy who sticks his hands down his pants and talks garbage like Rudy Giuliani working for you. And I will laugh and they will laugh. But if you're a fucking liar, you can get tens of millions of people to listen to you, to believe you. And so my 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 takeaway is, you know what? You know, Fucking liars win. They can win a presidential election. And they can win even when they lose an election because eventually when, I don't know, like somebody with a sidearm marches into the White House and removes Trump, there will be tens of millions, not 70 of them, because Jenny made this point last week, just a lot of those people are just Republicans who instinctively can't bring themselves to not vote Republican, and I get that. But there's, I don't know, 25 million, 30 million Americans who are like, I'll believe that. I've even encountered some of them myself recently, like here in Canada. People are like, yeah, but don't you think, I mean, there's all sorts of, I heard the voting machines are all fucked, and you know, the whole thing, they just, they're, 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 it's, it's sketchy, eh? they're taken away. So if you lie loud enough, and you lie long enough, uh, enough people will buy your lies that you can then send a note to those people asking them to give you money so you can lie again next week. And it fucking works. It appears to work. So I don't know what it means for the future of integrity, but lying looks to me like it's got a big, bold, bright future. Oh, yes, so because Trump. Donald, Donald Trump is the first president to ever lie. No, okay. I, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Uh, yeah. Okay. All these things are comparable. All these things are comparable. No one has lied in the manner and the scope and the, as a persistent foundation of their personality in business and in politics like Trump. And the reason that the other Republicans can't speak out against Actually, it I don't know about is that, that Scott. I, about I, I the mean, people who believe his lies. He lied, you know, I mean, uh, um, big li- lots of lies are big lies. You know, nobody's ever told me a bigger lie than George W. Bush did about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Not- for sure. Donald Trump and, never told me a bigger lie than that. Nobody lies and he gets ahead. And yeah, if you're both saying there have been lots of examples of people who've lied before and they've gotten ahead for sure. And we've always known, and it's been said before, if you're going to lie, make it a big lie. Um, and uh, no, but George W. Bush is Scott's new hero. He was, he was tweeting during the election that calmer, calmer heads and, 
and uh, the diplomacy of George W. Bush, we needed to hear from him. That's what that's what the U.S. Want, needed to hear from. I will have you know that I stood in the Oval <laughs> Office and George W. Bush said that I was good looking. So he's been my hero for some time. <laughs> Actually, I thought he said you were cute. Uh, I think he said my Scott ain't as good looking as your Scott. He's got a pretty face. That's what he said. He said he turned up. <laughs> <laughs> He turned up on. He said, "Cause Scott McClellan is like five foot three, and he's kind of pudgy and bald." And he goes, "Man, your Scott, he's got a pretty face. Mine's a little round turd, eh? Uh, you got a, your Scott's better looking than my Scott." And it, like, listen, yeah, you know, it's only really weird. Only when I was standing next to that guy, right? Like, it's not like anybody sees me coming down the street and says, "Jesus, there goes, uh, you know, there goes James Bond." Really weird conversation. Why isn't Trump leading the charge? I don't know why you call it weird. It was a fine conversation. <laughs> we could spend why some time here Trump talking leading? about how handsome I am. I'm not up for that. You're less handsome than your shirt. Harry Chapin. How much? Yeah. More? I love Harry Chapin. I love Harry Chapin. Name three songs. Name three songs. Taxi, W-O-L-D, Better Place to Be. Better Place to Be is my all-time favorite Harry Chapin tune. All right, most people can't get past Cats in the Cradle and Taxi. <laughs> hey, like he's got a lot of good songs. 30,000 Pounds of Bananas? You put three kids into a car and put that song on, they're taken care of. They're laughing, they're singing along. It's a ball. Excellent. Forget about Harry Chapin. <laughs> and forget about how good looking you are. Why Never. isn't Trump out there every day holding rallies across the country? Huh urging this thing forward, moving it forward. Why has he literally disappeared? What's the sense of that? He's, he's trying to get this movement going. The people seem to be out there waiting to be mobilized. If he'd spoken at that thing, if that March on the weekend, maybe there'd have been more people. Maybe he's just, I don't know, despondent, angry. There's yeah. reports that he just, he basically eats McDonald's three times a day and, 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 and you know, is thinking of the White House. Who knows? I, it does I got no better right. explanation. Maybe it's all <laughs> bullshit. He's just really despondent, but he wants to. He's just Listen, trying to create he, a smoke screen. But he's yeah. he's thrown he's thrown out there that he he wants to run in twenty twenty four. He's talked about uh, starting up a network to uh, uh, to destroy Fox. So um, it it seems that his head has kind of moved past this election, regardless of I think what he's um, what he's saying and and. You know, the fact that now the only person he's got to rely on is uh, is Rudy uh, in terms of uh, of the legal arguments. I'm, I'm like like tr Trump for you can say a lot of things. He's not stupid. So I, ca I can't see him watching Rudy and thinking, OK, well, this is going to turn out well for me. <laughs> <laughs> I love Rudy. He's so good. The Bob Bradley. Rudy is I went back and watched the Nevada recount uh, episodes of Veep and Rudy is Bob Bradley. <laughs> Just not as likable. Can't beat it. Hey, I normally I don't pay any attention to what happens across the pond in Britain, uh, in politics there. But there's been this thing that, you know, Terry reads the Daily Mail and he gets celebrity gossip. And so she pointed this thing out to me about Dominic Cummings and what was going on there. And it's not just a routine sort of staff changeover. It's, it's actually super weird in that Boris Johnson's fiance is a former activist in the party and is a very significant political advisor to the prime minister. She was the former and, of the party. Yeah. 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 And so she disagreed with who Cummings thought should be the chief of staff. And he thought that he could, leak against her, as they call it over there, brief against her, and take her on in a power play and win. Yeah, you never... You never like, how, how did he think that was going to end? Yeah, you, 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 never, you never pick a battle with the person that, uh, uh, it, 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 that they go to, the politician goes to sleep with every night. I was wondering how you were going to no. end that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> the only time that Boris's hair straightens out is when Carrie's around. Are you in there, Dominic? <laughs> but this isn't the first time. If you remember when she was, uh, I don't know if she was the decal working for the, uh, the, the London Conservative Party or the Conservative Party. 
um, Linton Crosby, who is an Australian, yes. uh, uh, an Australian ad, uh, ad, political advisor, worked for uh, um, Abbott um, and was Johnson's advisor when he was uh, running for mayor. Um, he, he's, he, he basically pushed her out with, she's terrible at her job and what have you. And there's a funny Canadian angle. So Linton Crosby, um, uh, there were all these rumors in, during the 2015 campaign when yeah. the campaign blew up that Linton Crosby was coming to, that was brought in to work for us. He never, he never did. He never was, never did. Um, but like all of these media would be writing stories like this is the man now behind Stephen Harper's campaign. And Linton Crosby's business partner used to tweet, tweet the stories out going with a picture of like Crosby on a bike going in Australia, hashtag not in Canada. <laughs> and then there'd be another story and he tweeted out hashtag still not in Canada. <laughs> um, but so this is, this is not, uh, this is not the first time this seemingly she has taken on people around, uh, uh, around Johnson. In the middle of the 2004 election campaign, Middle of the 2004 election campaign, which was not going well, Jenny. I don't know if you were following it or not, paying attention. You're young. But um, <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of it, it was not. In yeah, the middle of it, it was not, friends, not. Hanging out. Not going well. And I got, I got instruction that the prime minister wanted to uh, adjust our tour schedule to get back to Toronto, to do campaigning in Toronto. And that made no sense to me. Um, and I finally got him on the phone and he's insisting that we go back to Toronto and I'm like, we're not in trouble in Toronto. He says, we're losing Don Valley West. We're losing Don Valley West. And then I realized what had gone on, which is that John Godfrey was scared. So Trish Godfrey had talked to Sheila Martin because they were close friends. And Sheila Martin had told Paul that we were losing Don Valley West and we had to head back to Toronto to save John Godfrey. And this is one of the few times I ever took on a spouse. I just said, listen, A, we are not losing Don Valley West. Things are bad, but they're not remotely that bad. And second of all, things get so bad that we might lose Don Valley West. I'm pretty sure John Godfrey would want to lose Don Valley West in that <laughs> circumstance. <laughs> He's not the kind of guy that's going to you know, stick around as eight people for the rebuilding. So, um, the, uh, so you know... But that's how it works. That's how it happens. There's lots of influence that gets, uh, lots of influence that gets played by yep. spouses and significant others. We all know. I mean, like Sheila was an important advisor to Paul. Pam, uh, Pam Goodale is a central political figure in Ralph's life. Uh, Jane Roundthwaite, central political figure in uh, Kathleen Wynne's life. This is it's a regular factor. It, it listen, it is, and I, I, I am in a unique situation that I'm. I've done a lot of campaigns, but I've also been the partner or the girlfriend of different politicians. And I'm sure that the people that worked for them were not happy <laughs> that, that, I, that I would insert myself into different uh, decision making. So I don't, I have a rule. I don't date politicians for this very reason. I don't ever want to find myself in that. <laughs> Uh, dynamic. And don't think I haven't had offers because as we were talking about just a moment ago, and I'd like to return to the fact I'm pretty hot. Um, but uh, I don't think people get the, I, I think people look at something like Dominic. Yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Rob Lowe, pretty. Um, bitty boop. I, uh, I don't think that people like, when they see someone like Dominic Cunning Cummings in the in the news, and they go, "Jesus, how could he have like you know found himself scrapping with the wife of the prime minister?" It happens all the time. Like it is literally an occupational hazard because family members get involved. Like family members get seriously involved in campaigns, and um, you know, I've. I literally have countless stories, most of which even on this podcast. David Martin had the occasional like, point of view about my brain power during the campaigns of 04 and 06. Yeah. He always saw it me with, he thought I was a genius uh, with insightful uh, wit. So we didn't, I don't know what you're talking about there, but, um, but I, I, but the other thing I just, I, one thing I'll, I'll tell a story in a moment. Uh, one of the weirder uh, family stories I have, but, and I, I literally have a, a bunch, but um one of the things that I just want to, and you guys have been through this uh, I, many times, I'm sure, but I don't know that listeners know that this happens. You'll often get a table composed and 
and a prime minister or a premier or a political leader will say, all right, I want my brother there. I want my sister there. I want my husband there. I want my partner there, uh, my kid there. And they do that. And you think, well, we want to accommodate that. Like, it's awkward to say, well, no, they can't come. But when they come, the room is fucked up. The room is severely fucked up because you can't have a conversation that's honest. You can't now have a conversation where you say, look, there's no fucking way we can do this kind of event uh, because the premier can't do that. She's not good at that. That's not what she does. Or we can't go there. It's fucked up for that reason. It's fucked up for the reason that if the kid, the sister, the brother, the uncle, whatever says, you know, I really don't think that we're talking about healthcare enough. We need to be focusing on healthcare. And that's wrong, wrong as rain. It's, it, I can yell at David across the table and say, I can't believe you're talking about healthcare. That's a ridiculous idea. And we can have it out. And we might even get so petty that we'd go to the prime minister and he, he's for healthcare and I'm not. And you have to decide to pick it's him or me. It's pretty or whatever the fuck you call that. And one of us can only stay. But you can't do that when you're around the table and it's, say, a spouse or a family member and say, well, that's dumb. That's flat out stupid. We can't do it. So then the conversation gets perverted and the energies have to be absorbed. So then you have to have a meeting after the meeting where you talk about, OK, well, what did happen? And then you have to have a meeting before the meeting saying, OK, well, we're going to have a phony meeting and for sure we're going to end up talking about health care. Well, that's a crock of shit. So let's go. Jane, we did not do this. Jane, Jane, we did not do this. Well, you know, the one Jane, thing I would you say were at the real meetings. The one thing I would say about Jane is that sometimes, yeah, you had to have those conversations about her because Jane was more than willing to intervene. But the other thing is that Jane eventually got to a point where you could treat her uh, directly and you could have those conversations with her. And Jane was willing. Jane was uh, tough and smart and she would just have those conversations. And you could say, well, look, you know, Kathleen can't fucking do that. And she'd be like. Oh, I'm not sure I agree with you, but all right. Like you could have honest conversations. She's one person where I found that you could get that way. And to be fair, Sheila Martin very rarely intervened on politics. And when she did, you could have an honest conversation with her. Um, the one story I would have in this fold and the weirdest thing. I think she thinks say, we fucked it all up, Scott, by the way, just so you know. I, well, I think they do. And, you know, <laughs> uh, they might be on to something, David. I don't know if you saw the results. But... I might be inclined to think that way, too, uh, if I was them. Um, I, I think, of course, the, we, I, I, th I, I think that it, we saved them from, you know, a far worse fate. If it hadn't been for us, oh, we would have lost times two. Um, I, one time I was asked to come um, to an official residence to do debate prep. And we're about one hour into debate prep. And a spouse walked into the room. A spouse walked into the room in a bathrobe. Spouse walks in with a bathrobe and a cup of coffee, doesn't say anything, kind of like weird smile, sits down at the table suddenly. Everyone's kind of looking around. Uh oh, what the fuck is going on here? Spouse sits down at the table, just sits there, consumes things, watches intently. Every time someone speaks, person's eyes would dart in and focus on that person. All right. About 30 minutes of this, when the room is becoming increasingly phony and tense. People are measuring their words. No one can speak honestly. And finally, the spouse intervenes and provides a lengthy dissertation on everything that the leader was doing wrong, everything, um, every, every personality flaw that uh, this person's spouse had, um, and everything that was wrong with the campaign, the campaign direction, and everything that they had just w listened to. And so it was a beating. It was a beating that wasn't just reserved for the staff. It was a beating in a bathrobe that extended to the staff and to the leader. So we watched the leader kind of get emasculated, just sitting there listening to this while they were told they're garbage, we're told we're garbage. And then literally, person got up, took the cup of coffee, and left. Is this that was how did Dion, how did how did Dion handle that? He just acted like she never came into the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretended like it didn't happen. It was demotivating <laughs> in the extreme. <laughs> David but may she's have, a counter terror may have she's a counter terrorism expert, may right? So she was Yeah. All right. So we only have time. We gotta go to our new section. We have a new section. A we have section. a new 
a segment of the show, a new segment of the show that people are going to excitedly hang on to the very end of this. This is our manipulative way to get people to listen right to the end. We're going to have a new segment right at the end. That's going we to save be the so best sugar for the end. Exactly right. So this is called "Hey You," and we shout a question out into the void, and. Uh, and uh, see if anybody responds or if anybody cares about our question. And nobody will care about my question except people in Saskatchewan. My question, my hey you goes to the Saskatchewan NDP and Ryan Miley if he is going to stay on as leader. Which is, please, at least for the entertainment value at least, think back and try to remember how you used to win election campaigns in Saskatchewan. And it wasn't by being innocent. It wasn't by being some moral exemplar of the Marcus of Queensbury rules of combat. Tommy Douglas didn't win 20 years in a row by playing uh, soft in the corners. Alan Blakeney didn't beat Ross Thatcher by laying off him. He beat him by making it look like he was leaving old people to die. The NDP went after Dick Culver personally and destroyed him. This campaign, you went into an election with the Saskatchewan party at huge levels of satisfaction and employed the unique and failing strategy of trying to leave people with their positive impression of the Saskatchewan party and start to say, yeah, you may think they're great, and they are, but we've got something we'll do over here. Screw it. You had to make a case for change. You had to prosecute that government with your advertising, with your debates. Learn to play politics the hard way again, and you may start to win again. Hey, you, Saskatchewan Indy. Go ahead, Scott. Oh, all right. Well, my hey you isn't quite as aggressive, but my hey you is to Christian Freeland. And my hey you is, hey you, what's going to go on with the economic statement? I mentioned this earlier. It's gotten kind of quiet. I think that we're, have to, we're going to have to soon make some financial economic decisions that are going to be very consequential. We're going to spend money big. And we're going to have to shift people's expectations for what to is going to come. It's no longer going to be about here are the projections. This is how long we're going to be in deficit, what we're going to try to do to work our way out. I think it's going to be a discussion about we're going to have to spend this many billions in order to secure distribution of vaccines across this country, which is going to be a gigantic logistical and distribution effort. Hey, we're going to have to spend a ton of money to maintain the retail sector. And if we're going to move into the business of bailing out the airlines, which I think we should do, then we have to know that we're going to end up with sectoral pressure right across the board. So my hey you is, hey you, Christian Freeland, when are we going to hear more about uh, the economic statement or the budget or whatever we're calling it? Because one of my disappointments for the past five years is that Bill Morneau did not use the, uh, the budget and the economic statements as a platform to communicate a clear narrative about this government, its values, its policies, and where it was headed. I think that's been a great um, a great missed opportunity. I think that Christian Freeland's got a lot more game, a lot more ability. And so I want to start hearing that uh, conversation happening now, because if that thing's going to happen in the second week of December, whenever in hell it's going to happen, uh, we're going to have to start to understand now what they're thinking about, what they're uh, going to decide and what they're going to tell us. Well, I guess my hey you is to my party as well. My hey you would be to... Uh... Uh, to Aaron O'Toole, who I think has done a uh, a very good job over the last three and a half months since he's been elected leader. Uh, but I'm very curious in terms of the direction uh, that uh, uh, that uh, that he was heading down in terms of talks talk about uh, private sector uh, union uh, uh, support for private sector union, which I'm not against. I, I think there are a lot of private sector unions who have supported conservatives, like private sector union members who have supported conservatives over the. Uh, uh, over the years, but I'm actually, I, and it's a genuine question. I don't know what that means. I don't understand what that, what the support for the private sector union uh, means. And and we all know in politics, um, uh, the holy grail of voter is the suburban soccer mom. And uh, um, I would just be curious as to how that policy is going to appeal to the 905 and the 604 and the the suburbs that the conservatives are going to need to win if they see a path back to government. So, hey, you. Great. Hey, you. And hey, you. Hey, you three. Hey, you two. <laughs> hey, you two. Thank you for this again. <laughs> thank, thank you for all the fun and energy uh, you brought to this. It's so great to hang out with you every week. 
Thank you to our listeners. Thank you to our sponsors and our presenting sponsor, TELUS. I'd like to thank the Air Quotes media team behind this, especially Jill Engelman and Metal Donkers Good for putting this episode together. I want to ask all of you as a special favor for um, uh, really probably Scott, if you could possibly find your way through the iTunes podcast website to give this show a review and a rating. It makes a big difference to how much Apple distributes the show. It really helps. And if we don't get five or ten new reviews after this show, we'll probably have to make some changes to the panel. I think that it's probably, we'll have to probably take that as a sign that it's not working. And I, you know, I think Scott would be the guy on the edge. So if you like <laughs> Scott on the panel. I'm on the bobble, man. Please. <laughs> five stars. <laughs> I'll, five, I'll do whatever it takes to stay, Dave. <laughs> Thank you very I'll, much. Listen, next Tuesday, what's that? I'll take. I'll do whatever it takes, boss. Like I'll. I'll change my role. You just. You want me to just bat? Uh, uh, clean up. That's fine. Like I'll do whatever it takes. Okay. I'll shave. I'll. I'll get new glasses. Whatever. Okay. You'll never run out of ground single. That I know about you. Um, I just want to say, by the way, that I've got a fun event coming up. It's not a hurly-burly thing, but next Tuesday, a joint Canadian Club Churchill Society event is honoring the old friend of this of this uh, podcast, Ralph Goodale, is being honored as the Person of the Year by the Churchill Society. It's a joint event uh, at noon next Tuesday, and it'll be Ralph in conversation with me. So there you go. <laughs> That sounds Tune in good. if you can. Buy a ticket to the Canadian Club luncheon for either Ralph or me or Winston Churchill, whichever works for you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. See you next week, next Tuesday. There'll be more fireworks here on the Hurley Burley panel. Jenny, Scott, love you guys.